Well, good evening. Um, we're going to start off here with uh, Pesticides 101. Uh, I encourage anybody to move closer if you want. It, it's not going to be a full room for this. We actually have a, a delay. The bus that has taken the tour this afternoon is stuck in traffic and still a uh, half hour away. So there's, there's a group of folks on there. But I'd like to welcome you all to our 32nd uh, National Pesticide Forum. And it, it gives me uh, great pleasure. My name is Chip Osborne. I'm on the board of directors of Beyond Pesticides. And my colleague here, Carolyn Cox, uh, also a board member. And uh, she's from the Center for Environmental Health in uh, California. And the go-to person in the country on pesticide issues, pesticide toxicity. And uh, one of the things that we always do in the first hour of our conferences or our forums is sort of set the stage. Beyond Pesticides is a, is a group that is really solution-oriented. In other words, it's our goal to find strategies and solutions so that we no longer have to you know, rely on pesticides that have become <clears throat> part of our lives in the past. And so what Carolyn is going to do for us t tonight uh, is to sort of outline the problem, identify the problem, and then tomorrow morning you'll hear some more of the issues, and then the afternoon will be solution-oriented. So with that, Carolyn, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. So this is the kind of presentation that's supposed to be like in a nice cozy living room and everybody's sitting around on the couches with maybe a glass of wine and you know it's real easy to just ask questions and so if you could all just kind of pretend that you're you know sitting in the living room with your glass of wine um, that would be great. Anybody who's willing to move up here so we can pretend a little easier, please, please do that. Um, and if you have questions, um, just you know, raise your hand. And um, like I said, this is meant to be very informal. So um, I'm happy to answer your questions at any point. So the name of my presentation is 10 reasons not to use pesticides. And the idea is it's just a really simple way to think about the problems connected with pesticides. So, you know, if you're staring at those fleas in your living room carpet and are tempted to get one of those drop things for your dog, or if you're um, at your kid's school and you see people applying pesticides and you want to talk to your child's teacher about what's wrong with pesticides, or if you're at the city council and explaining to them why they shouldn't be spraying the park, or whatever situation you're in, hopefully you can use this information as kind of a framework for what to say. So number one of my 10 reasons is that pesticides don't solve pest problems. And right now you're all thinking, what is she talking about? Isn't that what pesticides are for, and don't the pesticide companies spend millions of dollars trying to provide chemicals that solve pest problems? But think about it for a minute. Um, pesticides, what they do is kill pests. Some of them do that really, really well, but there's a big difference between killing pests and solving pest problems. The way I like to think about this is anybody who gardens knows um, if you kill a weed, you know, whether you spray it with something or just pull it up, what's the most likely thing that's going to sprout in the place of that weed that you just pulled up? Another weed. So you haven't really solved the problem, right? Um, so. Uh, if pesticides could really solve problems, and you consider that we've been using um, synthetic chemical pesticides for over half a century at this point, um, you would think we wouldn't need them anymore, right? We would have solved all the pest problems and we'd be ready to move on. That, in fact, is not the case. Um, pesticide use has gone down a little bit in the last few decades but we still use well over a billion pounds of pesticides every year in the United States. Um, and I um, invite anyone to try to argue with me, but I think that's proof that we haven't solved a whole lot of pest problems by using pesticides. 
Um, so how do you solve pest problems? Well, um, pests need basically the same things that you and I need in order to be happy and um, live a long time and have a lot of kids if that's what you want to do. Um, we need a place to live, we need food, and we need water. And um, for weeds, it's maybe a little bit different, but instead of food, just think nutrients, water, sunlight, um, and um, it's about the same. So um, the first thing is about uh, finding a place to live. Um, the common pests that are in our house have lots and lots of nice places to live outside, right? They don't need to come in our house to our nice place to live. Um, so one really important thing is just to keep them out. And it's not too hard. Um, we're talking things like screens in the windows and caulking cracks where they might come in. Um, here's a couple other ways to keep pests out. Um, if you look carefully, um, there's um, a flexible strip along the bottom of that door, um, and that keeps pests from being able to come inside um, in that gap between the door and the floor. Um, escutcheons are very cool things, which most people have never heard about, um, but it's just a round donut-like thing which um, fits around plumbing pipes. So um, there isn't a gap there where pests can crawl along the pipe and get in and out. Um, so don't feed the pests. So things that pests like to eat, keep that out of reach. Um, so keeping food in jars is a really good idea. Um, if you have a pet, um, you may need to um, put the pet food away when your pet has finished eating um, so that the pests don't come and, and uh, make a meal out of it. Um, don't give pests stuff to drink. A lot of times pests come into your house, especially ants. They come in as much for the water as for the food. Um, so a couple of ways of um, making sure that you're not giving pests drinks. Um, fans in places like bathrooms where there's a lot of humidity um, are really important. And then just fixing plumbing leaks uh, so that there isn't a drip, drip, drip there to um, just, you know, a nice drinking fountain for pests. Um, and then just um, I know that everybody's house is absolutely sparkling, and we all spend a ton of time cleaning our house. Um, but if you do have a pest problem, like cleaning just more than you would normally do um, is really helpful. And again, that just removes the food and the water and the places to live that pesticides that pests might use. And so by doing all those things, you're solving the pest problem rather than just killing pests. Um, and in agriculture, it's kind of the same thing, uh, maybe a little more complicated. Um, there are sometimes um, good bugs, beneficial insects that can eat pests, and farmers can do things to increase um, how many of those good bugs there are. Um, Compost to build a healthy soil means that the plants you're trying to grow are healthier and happier and better able to deal with pests. Um, picking varieties that are well adapted to your area and um, not so susceptible to pest problems can be a real help. Um, green manure crops, which are um, Crops that you might grow like during the winter when your garden's not um, growing other things. Farmers also use them in between um, their main crops. Um, and so they do a couple of things, but um, they make it really hard for weed seeds to germinate because there won't be enough sunlight getting down to the ground. And they also um, can put nutrients into the soil to make the plants healthier and resist pests. Um, and then growing diverse crops so you don't just have a huge field of um, corn or whatever um, will also help with your pest problems. So the pests that like one type of plant often don't like a, the other type of plant, and it just helps you minimize the problems. Okay, so reason number two, um, and just to restate the obvious, pesticides are bad for us. They're hazardous to our health. Um, and I know that 
any of you who have been involved in pesticide issues have heard people say pesticides are completely safe. Um, it's not true. In fact, they're designed to cause harm. That's what their purpose is. Um, even the Environmental Protection Agency says that pesticides are bad for our health. Um, and there's a quote from EPA which uh, maybe will be useful to you if you're talking to people who need um, convincing. Um, so um, what I wanted to do is just look at um, a couple of example pesticides to show you what kind of health problems there are. Um, and I'm, what I'm going to do is look at the herbicide, that means weed killer, that's most commonly used in the U.S., and then the insecticide that's most commonly used in the U.S., and then the fungicide that's most commonly used. Um, so fungicides are things designed to control plant diseases. Um, so um, I'm sure that most of you have heard of Roundup. It's the most widely used weed killer in the country, about 190 million pounds a year. Um, and um, here's what the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health says about Roundup. It damages our genetic material and it causes birth defects. Um, so if somebody tells you that it's safe, Here's something that you can say um, in response. Um, Chlorpyrifos is the um, insecticide um, that's most widely used in the US. Um, for about the last 10 years, it had, um, its um, household uses have been um, ended, but it's still really widely used in agriculture. Um, about 11 million pounds per year. And again, here's what the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health says about it. Um, not too different from what it said about Roundup, but damages our genetic material um, and also um, affects development of the nervous system. So that means um, young children who are exposed to this chemical, um, their brains aren't able to develop as well as they should and more on that in a minute. Um, chlorthalonil is the most widely used fungicide in the country, about nine million pounds a year. Um, and again, this is what NIOSH says about it, damages our genetic material, affects our fertility, and causes cancer. Okay, I'm gonna move on to reason number three. Pesticides are particularly bad for children. Um, and this is for a variety of reasons. Um, so kids, because they're small, um, for their size, they drink more water and eat more food than adults do. So if there are pesticides in the food or in the water, they will get more for their body size than adults do. They also, just the way they play, they touch everything, they put things in their mouth, all that kind of, that increases their exposure to pesticides. And on top of that, they're growing and developing so that if the pesticide has an adverse effect on them, um, it can be a more important effect because it affects the way that they grow and develop. Um, pesticides are widely used in agriculture. Everybody knows that. And the result of that is that much of our food has pesticides on it. Um, so pretty much every year, the US Department of Agriculture does a um, monitoring study. And they go out and they buy food just at the grocery store like you and I do. And they prepare it the same way that you and I do. So they you know, peel the oranges and that kind of thing. And then they test it for pesticide residues. So this is the most recent data from 2012. So a little more than half of the samples that they tested um, had pesticides in them. Um, about a quarter had one pesticide, and about a, a little more than a quarter had more than one pesticide. And I think um, there was one sample that had 11 different pesticides in it. Um, so um, that's just to say that pesticides are common on our food. Um, here's a couple of things where um, pesticide are, are were commonly found in this 2012 study. So 
They tested tangerines, and 97% of the tangerines that they tested had at least one pesticide in them. Um, and again, they peel the tangerine first, so it's what's inside the part you eat. Um, uh, a, a kind of a new thing in this 2012 uh, project was that they tested baby food. So 76% um, of the peach baby food samples that they tested contained at least one pesticide. Um, that's my new granddaughter there. She eats only organic peaches. <laughs> Sorry? Do you know what kind of pesticide it was? Um, there were a lot of different ones, and I can give you that information. Yeah. Um, so the next thing is that um, while you know, we all eat food and breathe air and drink water every day that has pesticides in it, um, farmers and farm workers are really on the front lines of pesticide exposure. Um, there's um, a, just an incredible study that's going on in California called the Chamaco Study, and it's um, a partnership between the University of California and um, a community um, in Salinas, California, uh, um, and they um, recruited pregnant moms to be part of the study. And the study's been going on now for um, close to 10 years, so they've got some really amazing results. Um, maybe scary is the right word. So um, they measured um, how many um, breakdown products of that common insecticide chlorpyrifos that we talked about before were in the um, mother's bodies during pregnancy. And then since then, they've been looking at the kids to see what they can find out. So. Um, if the moms had higher levels of insecticides, um, their pregnancies were shorter, the newborns didn't have as good reflexes as they should have. Um, later on, when the kids were seven, they had lower scores on IQ tests, and um, they also had a higher risk of ADHD. Um, so, you know, when you go to the store and you're trying to decide, should I buy the organic one or the conventional one, think about the people that are making your food and um, what kind of an um, environment for them you want to support. Um, there's also a huge study going on called the Agricultural Health Study, which is a study of farmers in North Carolina and Iowa. Again, it's been going on for a long time, um, about at least 15 years, um, has um, had some amazing results. Um, but they've linked a whole variety of health problems to pesticide exposure, um, cancer, asthma, diabetes, on and on. And um, tomorrow we get to hear from one of the scientists that's part of the agricultural health study talking about um, new research about the link between pesticides and prostate cancer. So that's going to be fascinating. Um, so um, another thing is that Pesticides are hard on our pets, and um, we often um, use pesticides to get rid of our pets' pests. So this is kind of a plug to look for different ways to do that. Um, so um, s these spot-on flea and tick treatments are really popular. That's where you squeeze it on the pet's uh, the back of their neck. And what happens is, um, as the pet moves and grooms and stuff, that pesticide spreads all over its body. Um, so there's been a bunch of problems associated with these spot-on treatments. Um, so the, the pet's actually getting sick. Um, and then this is an old study from back in, two, so it's 10 years old now, but it's still one of my favorite research studies because it's, um, well, it's unexpected. Um, so there's a veterinarian who um, looked at um, Scottish Terriers and um, was noticing that they got an awful lot of cancer. So he did this study to look at their exposure to lawn care herbicides and whether or not they developed cancer. And um, what he found was that these um, terriers that live in houses 
where there are lawn care herbicides used um, on the lawn are four times more likely to develop cancer than um, terriers who live in homes that don't use lawn care um, pesticides. Okay, um, now I wanted to talk a little about my seventh reason not to use pesticides, which is that they're in our water. Um, and they're in our water everywhere, which is amazing to me. Um, so the same study that I talked about, about the pesticides in food and the tangerines and the peach baby food, they also looked at um, pesticides in drinking water wells. So these are wells that either provide water to like a town or um, uh, just a private home or uh, schools and daycare centers. And they found 40 different pesticides in the well water that they tested. Um, and again, it's like you're drinking that stuff every day. There's also, um, in the last 20 years, a huge nationwide study of pesticides in streams and rivers. It was done by the US Geological Survey. Um, and they found pesticides in um, over 90% of the um, streams and rivers that they tested. And they tested um, all over the country. Um, here in Oregon, um, they looked um, up and down in the Willamette River Basin. Okay. And um, let's not forget the rest of the critters that share the planet with us. So. Um, pesticides are hard on fish and birds and bees. You're going to hear a lot about bees tomorrow, um, but just kind of a quick reminder about fish and birds. Um, so again, I'm going to go through those same three pesticides that I went through before. Um, Roundup. Um, some Roundup products are toxic to fish, um, and this is a quote from EPA. Uh, chlorpyrifos, um, the insecticide I talked about before. Again, this is a quote from EPA, and it's a little bit of, um, you know, um, regulatory agency jargon. Um, but it, what it says is, you know, using chlorpyrifos just one time um, causes problems to small mammals, birds, fish, and the little critters that live in the streams. Um, and chlorthalonil, that's the fungicide that I talked about before. Um, they, it's caused um, problems for birds in being able to lay their eggs and hatch their eggs. And it's also very highly toxic to fish. Um, so this is just to stand back for a minute and remember sort of the person who um, publicized problems with pesticides um, for, for the first time, really. Um, and is really, you know, I think the reason why we're all here, and um, that's Rachel Carson. Probably most of you have heard of her. She's the author of Silent Spring, um, which is a great book. If you haven't read it because you think that something written in 1960 doesn't apply today, just pick it up and read some of it, because she um, she was amazingly forward thinking, I think. Um, and um, her her original impetus for getting into this issue um, was because of the effects of DDT on birds. Um, but she also became very concerned about just you know everybody's health, especially um, she um, got breast cancer in the middle of reading, writing the book. Okay, so um, I just have a couple more things. So we're, we're on reason, not, re, reason number nine. So pesticides, um, you've probably heard people say, well, doesn't the government test pesticides? And they wouldn't sell anything that wasn't safe, right? Well, in fact, the government does very, very little testing of pesticides. Um, who do you think actually tests pesticides? pesticides. Well. <laughs> These are the companies that profit from the sale of pesticides. And they're, those same companies are the ones that test them. So um, 
This is a rhetorical question that you don't have to answer. But if you're selling a product and making a nice profit on it, how likely is it that you're going to do health and safety testing that shows there's a problem with that product? Um, Right. And make, also make the equipment that screens for cancer and other diseases. So it's not just, it's this whole vicious circle kind of issue. They also don't test mixtures so that they will test an individual pesticide, yeah. but the fact that that gets mixed in with all these other pesticides is yeah. inaccurate. Plus, they also don't test the inert. Yeah, so that's a perfect lead in to. Reason number 10. So <laughs> pesticides have too many secrets. So if you've ever tried to find out like what pesticides are used at your kid's school or what pesticides are used down the block from you or even what pesticides your city government uses, let alone what pesticides are used on the farm where you work or live nearby, you'll know that there are a lot of secrets about pesticides. But even if you were able to get that information, you still wouldn't really know what you were exposed to because um, every pesticide, virtually every pesticide, is not just one chemical, but a mixture of chemicals. And many of those chemicals are called inert. It's just a misleading term. Um, and they're not publicly identified, so we don't know what they are. Um, and um, even if we did know what they are, um, the, most of the health and safety testing that we're really concerned about, um, does it cause cancer, does it cause birth defects or whatever, that's just done one ingredient at a time, and it's not done on the inert ingredients. So we really have no idea what this cocktail of chemicals that we're exposed to actually does to us. Um, and with that, um, Let's go do our sustainable community thing, which is what we're here for this weekend. And um, I don't know, is the bus back yet? No, they, uh, they can't, nobody's picked up. So why don't we throw it open to questions? Okay, I'm so. Great person to answer questions. Yeah, so I am totally happy to answer questions. So. Um. All right, are there any uh, pesticides that are linked to autism? There have been some studies that link pesticide exposure to autism, and um, I think that um, Jimmy Roberts, who's a pediatrician, is probably going to be mentioning that tomorrow when he speaks, and he'll have more details than I do. Um, but um, it's, uh, um, I think probably everybody knows who's looked at autism. It's a really complicated subject, and there are um, a bunch of factors that weigh in, and there probably is no you know, one single answer, but there are studies that have linked autism um, to pesticide exposure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, um, I, I, it's, that's, I think the short, oh, yeah, so, um, she was asking, um, because, uh, glyphosate has been found in breast milk, doesn't that mean EPA is going to have to do something? Um, and, and the simple answer, which is not really simple, is that, um, we have a law that regulates pesticides in this country. It's called FIFRA, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. And it was, the, the main part of it was written in 1972. Um, and it was um, passed by Congress um, with a lot of encouragement from the pesticide industry. Um, and it's not really a law that's um, protect, health protective, it's really a law to help pesticide companies sell pesticides. So um, what it says is that um, uh, EPA is not supposed to allow any pesticide to be sold if it 
and this is a you know legal quote, um, poses an unreasonable risk to humans or the environment. And that's actually defined legally. And what it says is when you talk about unreasonable risk, um, you have to take into account the social and economic benefits of the pesticide. So um, it's what in jargon is called a risk benefit law. The problem is the risks, um, they fall on everyone who's exposed to pesticides. The benefits really only go to the pesticide companies. So you're really comparing apples and oranges. Um, EPA has kind of said, well, we're just gonna let the market decide. So if something sells, it must have a benefit. Um, so that was a complicated answer to your question, but I hope that that... So in other words, no. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, there's very little that they're actually required, have to, mandatory, have to do. You know, we actually have a compost expert sitting over here, and he's going to be speaking tomorrow, so maybe he can address that question. It's definitely a serious issue, um, and um, uh, I think I'm just going to let Chip. Yeah, we can talk, we can <laughs> yeah. talk about that. Yeah. Residue, there are some pesticides that are uh, persistent that do not break down in a compost. They, and, and some of those uh, herbicides, they don't have a registration to be used out in the general public where grass clippings or, or yard waste would, would go into a compost pile. They have a very restricted label law that says that they can only be used on a golf course. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen because distributors will sell it. I did a, I did a project with a municipality transitioning all of them from pesticide to organic and they had four pallets of fertilizer laced with equilibrium because the distributor sold it to them as, as excess inventory. So it does get out there. What we're actually doing now is really taking a hard look at compost because up until this point, we've always believed that the biological processes and the organisms in composting break down environmental toxins. So what we're actually doing now is doing toxicology tests on finished compost to determine what of the common lawn chemicals or yard chemicals the general public has readily at their disposal end up through the process and end up, and yeah, there are amounts and it really needs, it's an issue that's going to be seriously addressed moving forward. Okay. Could they be an organic compost? When with certified organic, with organic compost, that means that we're looking at all of the inputs that go in there. So if the inputs that go in uh, it, you know, have not been in contact with pesticides, then it's not likely that they would be in there. The problem is that if composting comes from, say, processed food waste, we just heard what Carolyn said about pesticide residues in food, it's likely to expect that that will end up in, in the finished product at some, you know, some degree of, um, you know, of, of, uh, of amount in there. So, you know, we end up having that dilemma because pesticides are so widely spread through, you know, society now that it gets <coughs> And when we talk about degradation in a compost pile and that breakdown, that's assuming that everything is perfect in that composting process, that we reach the right amount of heat and temperature for the consecutive hours necessary to begin to encourage degradation of these products, and that doesn't always happen. So that the, the, the imperfection and the why all compost is not created equal we could bring 10 composters in here and put 10 piles in front of us. They might all look the same, but they could be widely different in both residue and quality. So it is something now that has never really been looked at seriously, but moving forward, you know, looking at that to try to come up with processes that will, you know, move things more in, in, in the direction where we have comfort using it for food production. Okay. <laughs>
Oh, all yeah. kinds of things. Yeah, we do yeah, absolutely metals, and yeah, we're yeah. testing now for, for heavy metal and residuals and, and all of that because that has sort of all just been pushed off to the side in the past. So I'd like to invite you to definitely go to Chip's workshop tomorrow and discuss this more. Did anybody else have a question that they wanted to ask before we um, wrap things up here? Anyone who has it? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> mixing atrazine and 2,4-D are said to produce 2,4-T, which is really closely related to 2,4-5-T, which is an Agent Orange. And do you know where there's a source of studies that talk about that and its, its uh, effect on public health or showing up in? Um, yeah, I, I don't. Yeah. Um, um, I will say that um, atrazine is a pretty nasty chemical. 2,4-D is a pretty nasty chemical. Um, uh, and um, yeah, I'm not. Um, Yeah, there's an incredible body of studies on atrazine and um, its a, um, effect on uh, pregnancy, um, low birth weight and um, miscarriages and things like that. Um, and um, also with 2,4-D, there's um, decades and decades of studies showing um, the problems connected with 2,4-D. Um, and, uh, um, are you familiar with Beyond Pesticides, Pesticide Gateway? Okay, so um, it's something that everybody who's interested in a particular pesticide chemical um, should know about. So if you go on the Beyond Pesticides website, um, the section of the website is called a Pesticide Gateway. And you can just click on the name of the chemical that you're interested in and just get a ton of information about it. And for some of the common pesticides, Beyond Pesticide has actually written fact sheets that kind of summarize the important information. Um, so those would be um, great resources for sure. Um, Jay, are we ready here? Okay. Um, so um, I was actually supposed to be sharing the podium this evening, um, and um, the traffic intervened. But now our other speaker's here, so um, I'm going to turn the... Mike over to Jay Feldman, the director of Beyond Pesticides, to introduce our next speaker. Thank you all. We just came back from an amazing tour of an organic hops farm and had a little beer, and I might have had a little too much, so <laughs> bear with me. Uh, and visited with farm workers, uh, the Pecoon organization, which is uh, Northwest Tree Planters and Northwest Tree Planters and Farmers. Farmers Association or Farm Workers Association. See, I told you about that beer, right? But I've got the great pleasure this evening of uh, introducing Evangelos Valinatos, who is actually a friend of mine. I came to know him over the last 30 years, actually, working on pesticide issues, and he is been in the trenches at EPA as an employee working in the Office of Pesticide Programs and doing a number of very interesting things that relates to pesticide uh, regulation, pesticide law, protection of health and the environment, or the lack thereof. And he's been talking about writing this book for the last 10 years or more. Um, and two days ago, his book came out, which is called Poison spring, and we're selling copies of it out there, actually. Um, so I'm really, Vagilos, I'm really happy for you that you got this book out. And I, I really think that uh, what he has to tell us is insightful, not only from a historical perspective, but from the perspective of going forward. Are we, adequ are we adequately protected under our existing regulatory and statutory framework? Uh, why are we not? What do we need to do about it? There couldn't be really a better person to tell us the answers to these questions, except for you, man. So, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. 
on the book. On the book, and you see it. Um, hi, I'm delighted to be here with you, and I do thank uh, the organization, and I thank Jay Feldman in particular. I met him in 1981, and we have been close ever since. I had, by the time I met uh, Jay, I was at EPA for three years. I joined EPA in 1979. And before that, I, it, I have to say a few things about myself so that you can begin to make sense about the story. I got a zoology degree, and then I studied history. I got a, <laughs> a doctor's degree in history, and then I did two years of postdoctoral studies in the history of science at Harvard. And by that time, before I joined EPA, I had already written a book about agriculture and how the knowledge gets moved from one country to the other. And I had already worked for two years on Capitol Hill on um, questions of agriculture and, and, and development. So when I got into EPA, I had some knowledge, not much, about what the EPA was all about, but I knew what the government was supposed to be doing to protect us. And I knew something about science. And by the way, most of my colleagues at the EPA were scientists. They're zoologists, biologists, ecologists, physicists, economists, you name it. They have all the, the expertise. And as a, I was hired as a program analyst, so I was a kind of a generalist. And um, the first year went well. I was working with a biologist, and we were trying to figure out what sort of information you ask the chemical industry to give you in order to be able to judge the product that they're trying to approve. And then I worked for a couple of years for the, an office that um, the director of the program created on, uh, to protect farm workers. They call it the environmental protection, I mean, uh, farm worker protection program. And this is the first time that I began to figure out that something was really, really wrong. <clears throat> they sent me to an intensive seminar in North Carolina. <laughs> And we had all sorts of expertise that they spoke about, the toxicology, the chemistry, you name it, about the chemicals about, on, on which really drench the farm worker in the field. And I said to myself, how could they actually allow these chemicals on the, on the market when you have humans that go there without, sometimes most of them, without protection, and this stuff gets on their skin, they breathe it, and some of those chemicals are then, and as they are today, they were neurotoxins, that is central nervous system uh, poisons. So after I got back to my office, I wrote a number of memoranda to the deputy director of my division. I usually used to work for either the deputy or the director. And I never got an answer to, that, <laughs> to those memos. <clears throat> and pretty soon I realized, you know, that um, I met other people who had similar problems, uh, ecologists, biologists, and uh, in our luncheon discussions, they would bring to my attention whatever problems they faced with their supervisors, similarly about the same kind of issues, and they would give me memoranda, briefing papers, you name it, and slowly I developed a whole library of everything that EPA was all about, at least in the Office of Pesticide Programs. And out of that, in time, eventually, I wrote the book. I wrote this book, uh, Poison Spring. So the book will tell you not just about me, it will tell you very little about me, but it will tell you about what EPA is all about. And I will just simply, I have a number of stories in the book, and I will talk only now about a couple of little stories that will illustrate the point. Here is the, <laughs> we have some slides that I would like to show you. And if you be kind enough to put it, they put it in the, I don't know how you do it, but. <laughs> I will keep talking while she, she does this. And uh, for instance, let's take honeybees, since this conference is about honeybees. I discovered by being there and talking to ecologists who were in the ecology, ecological effects branch that in 1974, EPA had approved parathion encapsulated in, in nylon microcapsules. If you please go to the, the you can find two files, one that it says EPA, PPT. Anyway, they were approved in, uh, in nylon microcapsules, 40, about 50 microns diameter, the size of a, of a pollen, and so that the honeybee wouldn't be able to distinguish what she was picking up when she went to the flower. And either the honeybee would die on the spot or she would go to the hive and the whole hive would die. And this is 74. So the, the ecologists I came to, to meet, 
um, they were very upset about all that. So they were collecting the data from all over the country. They were writing memos to their superiors saying, look, we need at least to put a moratorium so we can find out what's going on throughout the country. But instead of a moratorium, they expanded the actual uh, registration, That's, let's say from corn to soybeans to alfalfa, you name it. And um, so, so the death rate continued to expand, and now we face the problem, the prospect that uh, the honeybees may completely be wiped out. Um, this year, early on this year, I called a beekeeper in Colorado, and I invited him to come to an, a meeting to a conference next year, and I'm going to and I invite people that deal with agriculture. And he said to me, "Friend, I want to come, but uh, I can tell you." By, by June of 2015, I will not have any honeybees left. That really bothered me. <clears throat> and this is just one example of what the problems we face. Why does EPA approve these chemicals? So this is how the, the, the answer is really very complicated, but it's not too complicated. Um, I will bring you now some evidence of this. When I got to EPA, one of the people I met was named Adrian Gross. This man was a pathologist, an outstanding pathologist, in fact. And he came out of the Federal Drug Administration. While at FDA in 1976, he discovered the largest EPA, I mean, scientific fraud in the US government. He discovered a major laboratory called Industrial Biotest, a laboratory outside of Chicago, that used to fake most of the data. And that laboratory used to do studies not just for pesticides, but for drugs, for all sorts of other chemicals. They did the testing for state governments, for the federal government, for private companies. And Adrian Gross um, discovered that. And the EPA brought him in 1979 to EPA to fix up their, their, or their group of toxicologists to make it more up to date and so on. But within a year, he discovered there was a tiny little fraud going on within EPA itself. That is, his toxicology colleagues, instead of going through selected tomes of, of data from the industry, they would go straight to the conclusion of the book, let's say, and they would plagiarize the conclusion and make it EPA policy. So he said, hey, they, they call that cut and paste toxicology. So they, once he brought it up, and EPA, of course, hired a consultant, and the consultants discovered, no, the problem wasn't that big after all. This guy exaggerates. So they pulled on his job, Adrian Gross, that is. They gave him an office and a computer, and he did zero for the next 10 years until 1992 when he died. So Adrian Gross, what did he teach me? We spent dozens of hours together for years, and he gave me everything he wrote. <laughs> He used to write beautiful English, straightforward, complicated uh, scientific terms. He would explain them very clearly. And that's how I learned part of the problem. That is, why does honeybee, why does EPA produce or rather approve chemicals which they know is going to do damage? And the law says you don't register anything that causes adverse effects on human beings and the environment. But they continue to do that because of this kind of fraud that I described because that laboratory had tested the major chemicals in the US industry, in the, U, in the in farm community, where the farmers, all this stuff of DDT, uh, heptachlor, all this stuff had been tested in that laboratory. So I remember being in a meeting in 1980, in the summer of 1980, when, this is Jimmy Carter administration in 1980, and they received, EPA received its orders to forget about the connections of the chemical industry with the laboratory, but to focus on the laboratory alone. And it took down to 1983 after an extensive uh, trial to put out of business this laboratory. And when people raise the questions, hey, what are you going to do about the chemicals that, have, that are on the market, but they are on the market because of fraudulent testing? The EPAs would say, well, look, we have complementary studies. And then, of course, they would ask the industry to repeat the studies. And that would take another two, three, four, six years. And this is what, that's the operation. Now, why all this is taking place? It's taking place because of tremendous political influence outside of the agency. That is, the, the, the likes of Monsanto, for instance, Monsanto had its own money in the laboratory. The laboratory I just talked about, they had their own and the man working for Monsanto right in the laboratory. So, 
but they didn't follow up. They didn't prosecute any of this uh, chemical industry, but they shut down the laboratory. And these people, the, in the influence of the industry goes, it's a very sophisticated stuff. I mean, it's not uh, I am telling you to, f to make things up or anything like that. No, it doesn't work like that. <clears throat> they have their friends in Congress. Remember, the chemical industry, the pesticide section of the chemical industry makes $40 billion per year. So there's plenty of cash. And they, 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 I don't know, I don't know whether they bribe outright congressmen or senators, but they do their bidding. They give them a lot of money. So the influence on the EPA comes through the White House, the Office of Management and Budget in particular, and then it comes through congressmen. Uh, I know for a fact that several times a congressman would call, say, the division director and say, uh, Mr. X, you remember the proposal by Y company about the product, and they said, what about if we have it in two weeks? Do you think we can do it? And in two weeks, this stuff would be approved. Would be approved. And, and then in addition to that, the tremendous flexibilities in the actual law that regulates pesticides. It was drafted by the polluters themselves, and it dates down to 1947, and then it was reviewed, and so on and so on. And a classic study, of course, is that of uh, DDT. And look at what the Americans thought in 1947. It's good enough for me. <laughs> I mean, look at the mother there with the, with the little infant and all this. And, um, and here you are. This is a picture from the National Geographic that you have children going through the, through the dust of the DDT. And so that means EPA is not acting in a vacuum. The country thinks about certain things, and therefore they get materialized in this organization. And uh, this is the year I joined EPA, and uh, you can see this is the cover of a magazine that, uh, in this case, they were sold case the EPA program, how wonderful it was, and that we protect your health and the environment, and so on and so on. And <clears throat> I have a number of, uh, and you, you see them, but the case about honeybees and the, the fraudulent case about science and the political influence of the three really, I mean, especially the political influence is the real disaster that is forcing the agency to act the way it does. Because remember, despite my criticism, despite the fact I have written a whole book about what they're doing, they're not doing correctly, there are a number of very good people within the agency. I mean, they're very good scientists, and they get very upset about that, just like the way I was. Um, I had uh, tremendous experience sometimes, but I also had tremendous disappointment. And you know, when you don't uh, fit in, they say you're not a team player, and therefore they begin to, to severely punish you. And if you worry about money, then you don't do things like that. You, bec you become a team player. And um, the decision is not outright to do this or do, do that. But, you know, people think, and they, they do all this cost-benefit analysis, and suddenly, the economists and the biologists, in fact, sometimes they are convinced that the, co the, the benefits to the industry are more or less benefits to the whole society. And they say, well, what about the hazards to, to the non-target insects? They call them non-target insects, things that you don't want to kill. So honeybee happens to be a non-target insect. And you have some people who love honeybees and they document the disaster, but they say, we really have no evidence, direct evidence that this is going on. But they do have the evidence. Because I remember seeing a, a dossiers full of pictures documenting the, 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 the tremendous number of honeybees, dead honeybees. But that didn't go very far. So, <clears throat> I mean, I, I have a several stories like this to tell you, but it, it, this is the, the key. The key idea is the political corruption. So if, we, if you ask me what would you do, I would say, number one, we as human beings have the responsibility to act differently. I mean, we already eat organic food, therefore we avoid all this, all this dangerous stuff. And then, as I was telling my students last year, I said, talk to your father and mother. They did these problems. They are responsible for it, for you. You come to a nice, expensive college to study, and you discover all these problems, or you hear all this news. And I told them, I mean, I, I talked to them for a whole semester about this issue, <laughs> not just an hour. A whole semester reading, I gave them primary source material to read, not just my stuff. And in fact, some of the students say, why wouldn't we have some people from the chemical industry to give us the, the opposite view? 
I said, that's fine. I mean, I said, I give you your articles that come from the chemical industry. So read them, and you make up your own mind. So I would, in addition to personal integrity, we need to be active. I mean, we need to, to not just to talk to us, that we respect each other and so on, but we need to talk to our children and to our grandchildren and to, to their friends and to the schools and to the universities. How come the universities are not up in arms? This is what I wonder, why not? You have all these thousands of biologists and ecologists and toxicologists who know what I'm, what I'm telling you. I may have revealed a lot of things that they don't know, but they also know that they know something about toxicology, they know something about toxicity, and they, know, they have all this tremendous scientific data that has been accumulating since Rachel Carson. Rachel Carson wrote the book in 1962. This is 52 years later, and I'm giving you the other story. I'm describing how the government made possible silent spring. That's why I call this poison spring. And in addition to, <clears throat> to that, you know, we use too many chemicals. I mean, there are supposed to be 80,000 chemicals on the market, most of which have never been tested. At least pesticides are tested to some degree, despite the fraud, despite all this. Some of them are tested, sometimes maybe they are tested even honestly. Though, in my recommendations as to what to do for the future, I would say take the right of the chemical industry away from testing their own chemicals. We need to create an independent testing organization, a facility, you call it what you want, that will actually test every chemical that is on the market. And then make it impossible for any lobbying to the EPA. In other words, we have to redesign EPA and make it like a federal reserve. The government, the president appoints, let's say, uh, nominates uh, Jay to be the, <laughs> the administrator for 10 years, give him 10 years, and then by law, you make it illegal for any person from the White House, Congress, or the industry to actually lobby Jay or his appointees. And he appoints the deputies, the assistant administrators, not the president. So you wipe out all that co collusion that exists. Because the people I knew at EPA, when I left, and when they left, they joined the industry. And what they bring with them? They bring with them the contacts, the telephone calls, the emails, the influence, the knowledge. So they will call me and they say, hey, you know, I have this product. How about, and uh, you know, since you know them, you, you, you cut corners, so to speak, and you do that. And uh, the, other, the other evidence that I have, by the way, in, in, the, in the book is that uh, this tremendous, tremendous pollution, this is why I call it the secret history of pollution, Tremendous pollution. I remember in 1983, the government had already funded the study, a number of studies, they call them environmental management reports. They never got published, but they, they, they were there. And they described state by state the problems with rivers, the problems with lakes, fish, birds, and all this. And uh, all these all this horror stories, you know, people will cover up, nobody knows about them, and they proceed. And as we were saying before, very little is changing in that agency. I left in 2004, nothing has changed. I mean, the Obama administration, I was not there. I left in the middle of the Bush administration. But Obama, from what I read, from being an outsider, I don't think he did any, 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 any spectacular differently than George W. Bush did, and uh, in fact, um, I don't think he did, and nothing, not much has changed. And that, that's, that's really regrettable because I voted for him twice, and we, <laughs> and we, all, had, we all had some kind of expectations. So to get back to what I would do, I mean, I, the EPA has to become independent, completely cut off from political influence, and we need to get moving. Uh, you know, the, the Greeks used to have a saying, saying, Sinathinaike <clears throat> in Greek means, you pray to goddess Athena, but you better do something about it. And this, is, this is exactly what we really need to do. And the beauty of this organization is that it's doing something, and he's doing it for what? All of you are doing it for 32 years. So we need to spread the news. We need to spread that we have a form of agriculture, sustainable, which is sustainable, does not rely on these hazardous materials. And in fact, it's as productive per acre like any other agriculture. Indeed, I end up the book with a story, in fact, a report, from a professor from the University of Michigan, funded by EPA, if you can believe it, again in 1983. And that woman studied onion production in Michigan, and she copper, egg, I mean, 50-acre 
farms with 10 acres and 5 acres, and she found the, the smaller the farmer, the less pesticides they used. The larger, the more pesticides. So if you bought an onion from a 50-acre farm, you would probably eat in 12 chemicals. And if you bought an onion from a five, you would be eating only more two or three chemicals. So all evidence exists, but we don't want to accept it. That the smaller guy, the family farmer, is far more capable to do what we need to do, and he's less productive. So there's no need to say, without this massive farm, we would have hunger. I mean, this is preposterous to, to hear that sort of thing. And it's very disappointing. And let me get now on this. Yeah, here, here is the, the spray, the typical spray. And this picture has come from the 80s, by the way. <laughs> and I don't, I don't think anything has changed, really. And you can see the waste. You can see the complicated process of mixing all these chemicals. And then you have these massive farms, and this massive amount of chemicals going, the massive amount of trash and it's created, and I, I have some cartoons that, while the cartoon is a cartoon that you're not supposed to take it literally, there is a grain of truth in all this. And, uh, yes, five, how much? Five minutes, okay. This is a 1969 study, and the interesting thing about this report is that it, this is a federal government report that says, yes, we have to be more careful in all this, but we cannot really do live without pesticides. And here is one of the unintended consequences. Look at this. The food that people eat depends on the class. If they are poor, if they are black, if they are whatever minorities, and they don't have enough money to eat organic food or to eat good quality food, they get almost double the amount of poison in their bloodstream. That's what it is. And few people talk about it, and people simply ignore it. This is another. And I have some more. I mean, this is from the, this is from the 80s when we have Reagan in the EPA, and you have all these disasters. I mean, this woman from Colorado came to shut the place down. That's her right there. <laughs> and <laughs> some ecological facts of the agriculture people. And in this, one, in this one, they say, well, we have to create an uh, agency that protects us from EPA, because this is because of the, the, the Reagan uh, people then. And the, the, we addressed the, the Monsanto and FDA stuff, the revolving door, which I think is absolutely deadly. This should be shut down. This should never permit any, any sort of movement from EPA to the industry. And if you want to work for the industry, then you better not decide from the very beginning you're not going to work for EPA. And, uh, and this is the, this, these are the people whose benefit the EPA economists do the cost-benefit analysis. I mean, this, of course, hilarious, but in a sense, they have a grain of truth in all this. And um, the science, we already touched on the science. I mean, you can manipulate science anytime. Uh, and some of the people who feel guilty about it, they do all sorts of, all sorts of things. Um, here, I, this is an article I wrote in 19, um, what is it, 89. I was teaching at uh, Humboldt State University, and I published this article in the Chicago, in the Chicago Tribune about global warming. I'm not a global warming expert, but I was reflecting on, on the current opinion then. And the people that I worked for them immediately they tried to fire me. I had to go to the administrator who happened to be a Republican, Bill Riley, and he told them to leave me alone. And so this is, so I'm, I'm through. This is, uh, this is, of course, the genetic engineering stuff. And in my opinion, the whole business of GM food and all this is simply another way but to extend the life of the chemicals. Now we use more herbicides, more insecticides than we ever did before. So don't let them tell you that they're trying to create a food that is more auspicious in order to feed hungry people in India. That's nonsense. This is uh, some of the ecological. <laughs> <laughs> and here is a very funny one, of course, a very dramatic one. And uh, maybe, you know, it, it reflects a point of pers a perspective that maybe. And this is the scientist and all this. And, 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 and the most serious effect, of course, is on agriculture. We have, by using this massive number of chemicals, we have expanded and we have created an, an agricultural system that is absolutely vast. Um, and you the violent kicking out of small scale, small scale farmers or, or small farmers. And here it is. Now, do you imagine this is a piece of land that you, you and I can fill perfectly well? I don't think so because this is very much inimical to democracy. In addition to everything I have already said, if you have massive size farms, you cannot 
also assume that you live in a democratic society because you have very few people controlling too much power. And that's, that's, that's what the image tells me. This is from the Coachella Valley, not far away from here. I mean, close to where I live in Southern California. <laughs> and uh, finally, this is the office of one of uh, somebody at EPA. And I said, well, this reflects the, the messiness of the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, we have this. Uh, here is the copy of my book, and I hope that you read it. And I, I'm here, and I'll be delighted to sign your copy, and I'll be delighted to answer any questions you have. And I thank you very much. Any questions? Is there any way to get a copy of your slides from this presentation? <laughs> Send me an email. I don't know. Maybe I will. <laughs> Is there any difference between any of the presidential administrations you work in? Uh, the, um, the Carter administration, I thought um, innocently that, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I thought that the Carter administration would have been probably the best, but I was misled because I already mentioned they decided not to prosecute the chemical industry. They made the decision not to, to ignore Monsanto type of collusion and corruption. And then, remember, uh, Jimmy Carter also tried to, to play the game of Reagan later, but he did it very, very diplomatically by saying that we have to fight inflation, which meant they told EPA and they told the other government agencies to come down, don't regulate. So I, I don't know. I think most, both Republicans and Democrats are pretty much feeling the same way when it comes to this stuff. The, the, the difference is one. The Republicans get to power and they immediately terrorize you. They threaten you with cutbacks, with firings, reefs, whatever. While the Democrats, they say everything is fine and just keep doing your work. And they rebuild the library and so on. So one of them is more violent than the other. But when it comes to regulation, they are the same. Yeah. Yes, 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 sir. I really don't know. I don't know whether they do or not. But uh, since we live in a so-called free trade, I would bet you that this is going on. We import, uh, we export. And in fact, oh, I'm, I'm glad that you asked this question. When we talk, I didn't have a chance to talk about what is an active ingredient. You know, people talk about the active ingredients that in X year we use Y pounds of active ingredient. And this is the active ingredient that goes through testing, either fraudulent or not. But guess what? That's not what they actually spray. They take the chemical and they mix it up with a bunch of other chemicals, which EPA call them inerts, if you can believe it, inerts. I-N-E-R-T-S, inerts. That means they do nothing. Well, those, those chemicals potentiate the actual toxicity of the central chemical, and you have a mess. In fact, they would take DDT and put it and use it as inert. This is after the banning of DDT in 1972. So it's just a, it's a terrible mess. And this is what the sort of thing, it's because the, the actual act was written by polluters. Yes. Anybody else? Yes, yes, ma'am. How do we do? We, we, we need, in other words, EPA has to be taken a very top priority among all of us and be so outraged that we actually talk to our congressmen and senators and say, this cannot go on. Because look at the children that they will get cancer. Look at us. Two, one in two men would die of cancer. One in three women would die of cancer. How far more you need to go before you actually act? And it seems to me, unless we resolve this problem, which has been going on for decades, then forget about global warming. Because this is the heart of the matter. This is food, water, the stuff we eat. It's just crazy to actually approve a neurotoxin and call it, it's OK. I mean, my god, this is just unbelievable to me. It's absolutely unconscionable that any government, any society would approve a neurotoxin and say it's OK. Yes, sir. But you know what? Information on the relationship between the USDA and the EPA. It's, it's too late. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, USDA is the mother of all <laughs> problems. <laughs> And EPA is a tiny little organization <laughs> compared to the USDA. But you remember how they created EPA? They brought bunches of people from all over the federal government, including from USDA, from USDA, and they put them there. So they continue with the same music. So, but EPA, USDA has resented terribly EPA from the very beginning, despite the fact that they have continue to have all this enormous influence. And they, they still have almost like a veto power of what EPA does. So it's, it's a mess. I think probably everybody's ready for food and drink. <laughs> Am I right about that? Are you sure about that? <laughs> um, and, the, and we will be happy to keep on answering questions while um, we're eating and drinking. So yeah. how about everybody um, go back and help themselves to that wonderful food? And